Hello and welcome to 3ABN Today, Thursday Night Live. I am so excited for this power-packed two hours that we have in store for you. So glad that you've decided to join us. I believe God is going to do incredible things this evening. Uh, we have Christmas Behind Bars and uh, Christmas Behind Bars is no stranger to you at home. I'm sure that you are familiar with Lemuel Vega. I've known Lemuel for probably close to 11 years. And one thing I can say about Lemuel is he is very consistent. He's been consistent throughout the years. He's passionate about spreading the gospel and taking it to those brothers and sisters that are incarcerated. But before I jump in and talk to Lemuel for a second, I want to share this Bible verse with you. It's taken from Matthew chapter 25. We'll begin in verse 34. Jesus said, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Christmas Behind Bars is doing an incredible work, and it is it's truly the Lord's work, as outlined here in Matthew chapter 25. So Lemuel, welcome to the program. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Jay. The only thing I can say about that verse, and I've shared it with the inmates many times, Jesus says, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren. Mm -hmm. So he equated himself with the least of the least, but yet his message was for the highest of the high, and it covers all spectrums. Amen, amen. Amen. Next to you, we have Brother Ben Daniels. It's great to have you here. As Thank you well. for having me. Yes, sir. I can't wait to hear your story. You got a powerful story, and, and we're looking forward to hearing that. Next to you, we have someone really official. We've got Sheriff the sheriff of Henry County in Indiana, John Sproles. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. Yes, sir. And sitting right next to you, we have Donnie Rutledge. I can't wait to hear your story as well because you have a powerful one. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. And we have Chaplain from Mississippi, uh, Maurice Clifton. It's great to have you here as well. And you have a powerful testimony. Yes, it's an honor to be here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we also have a, a couple pictures that we're going to kind of go through and we'll take a look at those. But Lemuel, why, why don't you kind of set things up for us? Well, this whole live program is sharing hope with the world. This prison, I got out of this prison 40 years mm -hmm. ago, the Pendleton Correctional Facility, and we just recently made 3,000 packages with the sheriff mm -hmm. and about 110 of the inmates came and made packages. Uh, we just delivered, Donnie, what was it, last week to this prison? 1,600 packages. Yeah. And uh, it's just amazing to be able to go back in and give back to a maximum security prison. So 40 years ago, I was released from this prison. Now we have an opportunity to go back and deliver packages uh, just last week. Yeah. So really amazing. That's incredible. What's it like when you go back to where you spent some time? You can't put words into letting someone know that there's hope for their life. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's what well, that's the great commission is go ye therefore. Amen. So. And, the, and the blessing is truly on the go for sure. And yeah. we receive blessings. We go wanting to be yeah. a blessing to them, but we leave and we're just, his word is magnified in our lives. So that's awesome. Yes, yes. We have a, a video that I would love to show before we come to you, Sheriff Sproles. Uh, let's take a look at that video right now. Today we have the sheriff with us, and you're the sheriff of a whole county, and so he has a perspective on Christ and sharing the gospel with the incarcerated. Yeah, thank you. I'm John Sproles. I'm the sheriff of Henry County, Henry County, Indiana, and uh, we was connected with Christmas Behind Bars this past Christmas, and um, you all delivered these wonderful gift bags 
uh, for us to distribute to our inmates. How did you see that? When you took the gift packages into the pod, you know, that was something new for you. How did you see the reception of that? Oh, it, it was amazing. And, and one thing that was very key that I tried to tell every inmate is where these packages came from. I told them, I said, somebody that was sitting behind bars just like you many, many years ago got this idea from the Lord to, to, uh, to, to help and, and give back. And so I think that connection, uh, telling them, listen, you're not hopeless. Look at the amazing work that God has used yeah. you to do. Amen. And I think that really spoke to their hearts. And, and the, the food and all of that was just great. But the literature, the gospel literature that was in there, we've had so many people say, man, that was so helpful. I, it's the first time I've read gospel literature. As far as a chief deputy, uh, what do you think working under this guy? I mean, because he has a perspective, number one, the Lord, number one, transformation for lives of incarcerated. So what's your thought in all of this? Yeah, you know, Christ commands us to love. There's no greater commandment in Scripture than to love. Amen. And I know that's his heart, and I share that same heart. And um, it is a privilege to be involved with this. And it's a privilege to serve under him and uh, be able to bring hope to people. Mm -hmm. So you guys have a job to do. You have to protect society. You have to incarcerate sometimes individuals that have broken the law. But the bottom line is, is what you're telling me, there's possibility and hope for their life. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. God continues to bring people alongside of us. Dennis Page is somebody who's been a grateful part We've been grateful to him to be a part of this ministry over the years. And Dennis, you actually begin to give your heart to Christ as you're on your way to a prison a sentence. Yes, you know, uh, God is so merciful. He intervenes in my life at uh, a very profound time. And I begin reading the Bible. Um, I wasn't gave, looking to go to prison. Gave you a <laughs> Bible study in the so, county jail, amen? Well, yes, while I was in, but before I got there, somebody had given me a Bible. Praise the One Lord. day I got tired of living my life. I asked God for help. The next day I got busted. I was on my way to federal prison while I was in the county jail going through my case. Somebody gave me a Bible study, and it was just so profound because it just took me from one subject to another on what the Bible has to say about all these different topics. Amazing facts. It was amazing. Amen. It gave me a lot of amazing facts about the Bible, and I loved it. And so I started a ministry right there in prison, reaching out to people, sharing with people, and then God, when I got out, God just rebuilt my life. 20 years ago, I was thinking, 20 years ago, our paths crossed. Amen. And I remember that uh, this was the very first prison, state prison that we were able to bring the program to. It's been a real blessing okay. working with you. It's probably been 17, 18 years ago, this was our first prison. Yes. What was your nickname in prison? Abraham, Father Abraham. Father Abraham, <laughs> and they called him Bi Bible Man. Bible Man. Because he always carried a little Bible, Bible with him yep. wherever he went. Yeah. And, and as you were seeking God's will for your life, you told me you'd read the Bible and you're still smoking dope. That's right. You know, I, I tell people all the time, you have to start somewhere. You know, we're not going to get cleaned up and then go to church. We're not going to get cleaned up and then go to Jesus. Jesus does the cleansing. He does the healing. He does the restoration. You just got to start and move forward. Richard Latour is the program director for this maximum security prison. And so his job is to, to allow outside programming. And he's got a Wonderful job. It's huge. Richard, could you tell me a little bit about your duties here and what's happened today? And then we'll kick into Napanee. Absolutely. Well, as far as responsibilities here at the facility goes, you know, we have a large population here, a right. um, mix of, of anything that you could imagine. Um, but we have a lot of dedicated guys here. Even though somebody might have life in prison, you still offer them programs and you see value in that. Exactly. Life in prison, they still need to have a life in prison. Praise the Lord. And so um, I'm a firm believer that the judge and the jury is who sent them here. Right. Their punishment was being sent here. The punishment isn't their time here. All so right. we need to make sure that they have something to do, something to be fruitful with their family, with their peers that they have here at the facility. Um, we've seen today with something like this that it provides them an opportunity to be fruitful for not just their peers, but peers in other states. Not just peers in other states that are at a male prison, possibly at a female prison as well. So it provides them an opportunity um, to branch out, to share a message of love that they have for others that they may not be able to share right here in this facility, or that because of some restrictions or because of 
whatever politics happen, it allows them to express their, their true love for others. Wow, that's incredible. Lemuel, I mean, you've been going to all of these facilities. What's one thing that you would want to share, you know, about going into these facilities? Does it take a lot of people to make this happen? There's hundreds of people behind the scenes that make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we could make all the packages and go, but if it wouldn't be people for like the sheriff or the warden or the administration that allows us to come in, we couldn't do it. So the number one thing is prayer and the Lord makes it happen. Amen, mm. amen. amen. Sheriff Sproles, what was your involvement like with Christmas Behind Bars? So I did not know anything about Christmas Behind Bars because I'm, I'm new in law enforcement. I've uh, been full time only for about six years now. Wow. And uh, so I, I actually was coming up on our first Christmas with me being the sheriff. And um, I, I had told our people, look, we've got to put together gift bags for our inmates. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, we, we put together, I think we had about 220 inmates, went and bought little gift bags and just bought several items. And I think I, we had spent about $4,000 for these little gift bags. I was kind of shocked. Wow. Again, I'm new at this. Yes. And then uh, Lemuel reached out to me and said, hey, I'm with Christmas Behind Bars. Um, you know, would you care if we brought some Christmas gifts? I'm thinking that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. They roll in with bags this big. Uh huh. Just and, and the literature and everything that was there. God brought us together. I'll tell you, it's, yes. it has been um, that. So that I just recently learned of them, and uh, I just my heart kind of just uh, linked with his heart. I, I love the caring aspect of it, and so I'm just I thank God for this for this connection. Amen. Yeah. Amen. What made you decide to go into law enforcement? Because you said you've just been doing it for a couple of years now. What, what made you to decide to go down that road? Yeah, so, so I, um, I, I don't apologize for being, I'm a pastor's son. Okay. And uh, my, uh, my in-laws were missionaries for 22 years to Papua New Guinea. So I've grown up in the church. I went to a Christian school. And um, I, I've been a church builder. I actually build buildings. I've oh. built over 100 churches all over Indiana. So, but, but when I was in a Christian school in high school back in 93, I graduated in 93, I wanted to get into law enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, but you have to be 21 to be an officer. So my dad is, like I said, he's a pastor and he was building churches. I fell in love with building. And uh, so I was building away. I had just got married at 20 years old. And um, so when I turned 21, I, I got sworn in as a reserve deputy. Okay. So you donate your time. And uh, I did it for several years and I was just too busy with church building and uh, raising a family. I got out of it for many years and I got back about eight years ago as a reserve. And then I felt the Lord wanted me to run for sheriff uh, because I felt like we, there was a huge need in a, um, bringing a Christian culture to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So um, I got back on as a reserve about eight years ago and, and I, I told my wife, I said, I believe the Lord wants me to run for sheriff. And uh, I was planning on just running for sheriff as a reserve, um, but a full-time position opened up. I put in for it. They hired me full-time. Yes which the administration told me after I won sheriff, they said, that was the worst thing we ever did <laughs> was hire you. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I was elected and I took office uh, January 1 of 2023. Wow, wow, praise God. So what does that look like? Because, and, and when I say, what does that look like? What does it look like bringing Christianity into that office um, from the standpoint of, you know, you see some facilities that they just want to warehouse people, mm -hmm. right? But then you also see some where they want to see people prepped and ready for re-entry mm -hmm. to society, to be mm -hmm. successful uh, returning citizens. So what does it look like incorporating Christianity in all that? Well, I could tell you very specifically what it looked like on day one. So January 1st, 2023 landed on a Sunday. And um, I had reached out to uh, many of our local church people and invited them to come out to the jail and to the sheriff's office. We just built a brand new $25 million facility. It's beautiful. And um, so I had reached out to them and said, let's meet and let's pray through the jail and pray through the offices on day one. Mm -hmm. We had over 40 people, uh, 40 Christian people come together and pray. And I want to tell you something. Let me tell you what my mom said. And, my, and again, pastor's wife for longer than I've been born. And um, 
with all of these different groups, different, different churches, different denominations, getting together and praying in unity for our, for our inmates, mm -hmm. for our officers. Mm -hmm. My mom said after later on that day, she said, I just, when that volume of prayer went up, she said, I, I, I looked around and watching everybody praying. She said, I've been living in a box. Wow. Interesting statement. Wow. And it's just the power of, of, of praying through there. I'm here because I care yes. for our inmates. Mm -hmm. Ben here is one of our former inmates. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I just, uh, our mission statement, I prayed about that. Lord, what so I read all these mission statements all about protecting and all of that. And God brought Micah 6, 8 to mind. Do justice, love mercy, and be humble. Mm -hmm. And I knew when I, I, I called my chief deputy, which you saw uh, earlier there uh, at the Pendleton Reformatory, great Christian guy. I called him and said, hey, Josh, I, I believe the Lord gave me the mission statement. And I told him, he said, man, it's, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Uh, we, we've got, we have to do justice. That's, that's our job. That's our requirement from the Lord. But love mercy, sometimes I don't see that like I'd like to uh, in law enforcement. Be humble, a lot of times I don't see that. Mm -hmm. And so we're just wanting to create a culture of care. Uh, we want to put God first in everything that we do. Yes. And, um, and, and the Lord is just, the Lord is working in wonderful ways. We just, we want to care for our people. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You, you know, that's, that's huge. I love that you're fostering that type of environment. That's going to uh, go a long way. Lemuel would talk about that. results. Mm -hmm. How many baptisms have you had out of the 220 inmates under your care? So I believe we've baptized um, almost almost a hundred, I think 80 or 90 wow. uh, males and females. And, and um, you know, I, I didn't know, I've got a lot of attention since I became the sheriff that I didn't know I didn't know I deserved, <laughs> but we started baptizing. And um, so I started getting letters and uh, I, the first letter I got was from some freedom from religion mm. organization that says we have 600 attorneys all across the United States. And if you do not cease immediately, in fact, I opened that letter when I was coming up to help you at help the Pendleton me. Reformatory. Yeah, I opened that letter and they said, we want to know what you are doing to, uh, to cease. What, are you, what, what kind of steps are you taking to stop this? <laughs> and I remember laughing. I was reading the email and I thought, well, one step I'm taking is I'm heading out to, for ministry <laughs> up at the prison <laughs> with the mule. So I thought you might have 600 attorneys, but you know what? We have, we have God. And, we, and so I'm, I, uh, there's some pressure there. Uh, we're going to do what the Lord wants us to do. Yes. And um, we're, we're just, we're not too scared about what, uh, don't fear who can kill the, the body. Yes. Uh, yes. So we're going to keep doing the Lord's work. Amen. Amen. I love that. Ben, what's your story? Ah, uh, well, I'm 40 years old. I spent most of my life in uh, Henry County. I uh, grew up kind of all over the country, lived in California, Connecticut, Oregon, Tennessee, mm -hmm. Texas. Uh, not really the best uh, family life at home, kind of grew up on the other side of the law enforcement mm -hmm. where uh, it, it was just kind of ingrained that it's okay to do the criminal type behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, got in trouble early on in, in adulthood and uh, learned that jail is not really the place you want to be. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Picked up some real bad habits and some addictions while we were incarcerated and in uh, found the Lord for a little while and stepped into the church and uh, kind of started uh, taking everybody's inventory in the church, stepped away from, from God and quit walking with Him and got back into the wrong lifestyle and made some more poor choices. Mm -hmm. Been in and out of uh, different facilities throughout the course of my life, probably spent 12 years over a year here, four years there. Over time, uh, this last time though, man, uh, the jail in Henry County used to be terrible. It was a gladiator school. Mm -hmm. it was every, free for all, the inmates controlled the jail, the, the guards did what we wanted, and uh, there wasn't a lot of administration wanting to take care of that. Uh, this last time in jail, Sheriff Sproles took over probably three months after I was in there. And he wasn't able to create miracles and change the culture overnight. But let me tell you, the, the jail atmosphere today compared to what it was mm -hmm. before he took office is way different. And yes. uh, 
meant them just be ministry and there's Christmas behind bars and the other different ministries. Mm -hmm. that, uh, he talked about bringing all those people in to pray for us. And man, that was the first time I'd ever experienced a, a, a powerful prayer group like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lord was with him that day. It was, he, was in the, he was in the jail and mm -hmm. you can tell it was a positive environment. Amen. Mm. Amen. So was that the, the, at the point where you just wanted to make a shift in your life? Like at what point in your life did you say, you know what, enough is enough. This is my rock bottom. I'm done with this. Uh, well, I'll be honest, the, the old jail administration put the bad inmate, the people that created a bunch of problems in the, in the old building before they built the new building, they mm -hmm. locked us, uh, they just locked us up pretty much 23 hours in a day. We were locked wow. down and I didn't do any, I didn't cause any problems when I came back into jail that time. I complied with the officers when I got arrested for the first time ever. I wasn't combative or any of that. And uh, I still got punished like I was doing those bad things. And I realized that something's got to change. You can't yeah. keep living like this. The people that you surround yourself with in those places aren't the type of people that I, God's moved something in my life and I don't want to be around those type of people no more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I just want to say we're glad that you're here. Thank you for sharing your story. Appreciate you and, guys having uh, me very much. Yeah, man. And, and I know that we're going to continue to pray for you mm -hmm. as you walk forward. You know, I'm, I'm glad that Sheriff Sproles, I'm glad you set that environment in there um, to, to make that change from the previous uh, previous administration and what, what took place in there. So thank you for that too. We have a couple of pictures. Lemuel, why don't you tell us what we're looking at? Okay. Uh, we've had the privilege to go to Mississippi and deliver care packages all throughout the state of Mississippi. This is our uh, chaplain down there at a state prison. Uh, he helped us ride in, deliver the packages in the prison. And then these are some of the staff members and some of the inmates that helped unload the truck. So it's really amazing to be able to go back in to state prisons throughout the state of Mississippi. Absolutely, absolutely. Chaplain Clifton, tell us about your experience because I know Lemuel just alluded to the fact going back in. Uh, did you do some time? What's, what's your story? Mm, I have a long story. We need more than a Thursday night to tell you about it, so I'm going to try to give you a, <laughs> <laughs> give you a sound talk. Well, I was born and raised in the Mississippi Delta. Okay. I'm my mom and dad. 20th child, straight A student in high school and college, but I was one of those kids that used to throw the rock and hide the hand. Mm. You know now, what I mean? Now break that saying down. <laughs> throw, throw the rock and hide Me the hand. that I was doing stuff that my mom and dad didn't approve of. Uh huh. And so, but nobody would believe me because here I am on the honor roll and they would believe that I was the one that was doing it. Mm -hmm. So that kind of transitioned into my adulthood okay. after I moved to Chicago and I kind of chose the street, the mm -hmm. school, I quit school. My sophomore year major in nursing in Chicago, ended up getting in trouble. And I kind of break it down to when I went to prison. I went to prison for 23 years. Wow. Um, Thanksgiving 1996, we always used to have family dinners and we would draw names. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of hustling in the street and I was just kind of tired from the way to the street. I had lost two of my best friends in 1996 and I was just asking the Lord for a way out. Mm -hmm. But I remember telling the Lord, I said, Lord, all my life I've lived my life for everybody else. 1997, I'm gonna live my life for me. Wow. I got locked up two minutes after midnight. Wow. <laughs> it's like the heavens open, I can hear the voice saying, you're on your own. Mm, you know? mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I went to prison, so I went to federal prison, got 33 years as a first time offender for six grams of cocaine and 20 years for money laundering. You said how many years? 33. 33 you know, years? The, fed, the federal system give you a time in months, so you're in, you're in court, you're trying to figure it out. So he said 400 months. I said, okay, 120 is 10, 240 is 20, 360 is 30. Now I got to take that 40 and do the same thing to it. Whoa. And so I got 33 years and four months. I laughed at it because I knew that it was God going to take me through the fire and bring me back out. Mm -hmm. Because I was raised in the church, I was raised in the apostolic church. So during my 23 year journey, I had to reinvent myself. Okay. I couldn't throw that rock and hide my hand Mm -hmm. I had to stand up in the mirror and say, don't throw the rock yes. because it's wrong. Yes. And so never smoke, never drink. So I chose to help other guys who were in prison. I learned that there was a communication barrier between the staff and inmates because mm -hmm. most time inmates don't know how to communicate with staff. So I started developing a reentry program. Oh, wow. 
And so I, you know, like uh, breaking ties, just teaching guys how to break their criminal thinking. Uh, wait a minute. So wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you were inside developing a reentry program for that's incredible. Well, yeah. So I went to four different institutions to start reentry program. Yeah. Not knowing that this was going to be my call or my opportunity to be free. And um, before I got released, I got released in January 10th in 2020, January 10th, okay. 2020. I lost a son a month and a half before I got released, Maurice Jr. Oh, from Kokomo, man. Indiana. Mm -hmm. You know, so I have ties in the two share. Mm -hmm. But long story short, I was in prison and God had sent me my wife. My first wife got killed while I was incarcerated in Indiana, in Kokomo. Wow. Uh, she was murdered December, t December 18, 2004. So I just had a lot of things going on at the time I was inside, but I still knew the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. But I kind of strayed. I was straying back to that old me, and in 2014, I got sent to the shoe. And for guys who <laughs> been incarcerated, you know that's the hole. Mm -hmm. So I spent like 19 months in the hole, and I used to do Bible study every day. I had a 365 life application Bible. And I did my study. While doing that, I was led by the Holy Spirit to get out of bed and pray for a young lady that I had met while I was incarcerated. Her brother was, I was his mentor Okay. while I was in prison. And the first night I disobeyed the Spirit and the same thing happened the second night. Mm. I said, let me get out of bed and, and pray for this young lady. Mm -hmm. But that young lady is now my wife and we have a daughter. I had five sons when I went to prison. So I got a 22 month old daughter. Wow. Now I've got married since I've been home. And so now let's transition to me getting out. The day I got out, Friday, January 10th, I was having the, one of the top five worst days of my incarceration. Hmm. The weight of my son, losing my son, the weight of losing my wife. My mom had just died in 2016. And after I got out of the shoe, I went back to, they transferred me to Bennettsville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. No incident report, did 23 years, only one write-up. That's the first, the first month I was in prison, I got a three-way phone call right up in the federal system. Didn't have any write-ups. So I went to Bennettsville, South Carolina, and they had the only apostolic faith church in the system. Wow. So that allowed me to get back into the Word of God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just started bringing that down into my soul. The young lady I was started writing with, we decided to take year by year to see with our relationship, and if I get out, fine, but I always wanted her to go. She said, no, I'm gonna stay one more year. That Friday, man, it had been raining all week and everything was weighing heavy on my soul. And the case manager called me and he told me that uh, it's time for you to go. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I said, what you mean? So you got a media release. Hmm. So here I am wow. getting out 10 years early, you know, but I always kept the hope bag. I had a little gray bag. I call it a hope bag because it's everything that if I got me, when I got a media release, not mm -hmm. if that that's what I was going to take with me. So you got out 10 years early. 10 years early. Wow, that's mm -hmm. incredible. I want you to share something for, for our, our audience. What would you say to someone who's about to get out? Like, what could they do to make sure that they don't go back in? If he hasn't done it on his first day of going into prison, there's no magic thing that you can do once you get out because you have to prepare yourself for that opportunity. Mm. You know, freedom is where preparation meets opportunity. Mm. So I prepared myself every day for the opportunity to be free. And so seven months later, Jason, I was had an opportunity from a, a young guy that I mentored before I went to prison. He's now the second in command in the state of Mississippi, Mississippi Department of Correction. And he had been watching me. I had been doing community work once I got out in Mount Bayou. I'm from a little town called Mount Bayou. It's an all black town in the Mississippi Delta. And so I was doing community work wanted to clean up the town. I was, you know, feeding people. I started my own nonprofit. Wow. And so he introduced me to the commissioner mm -hmm. and I got hired as a chaplain slash reentry coordinator. Wow. So I started Praise developing reentry programs within the Mississippi Department of Correction. I didn't know how bad our prison was until I got a chance to go in as a free person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so wow. I developed Go ahead, let me. How long were you out of prison before you got hired as a chaplain? Seven, seven months. Seven months? That's seven months and of. ten days. That's unheard of. So God had set him up through that yes. training in prison, and it's phenomenal. Absolutely. That's how we connected, because he's a chaplain there. That was my next how, question. Oh, how did yeah. you guys okay. connect? How we connected. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I was in, I worked at Parchman 
uh, Unit 29. I asked the 29 because that's what death row was. And I wanted to be that beacon of hope for guys who were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. To say that if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. Yes. But you got to prepare yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I developed trauma classes because I learned while I was incarcerated that most people who are incarcerated got some type of childhood trauma. <laughs> yes. So I had to teach them how to deal with their aces. Mm -hmm. You know, so, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that um, I helped them do. So now, Death Row, being on 23 and 1, had never came out. They come out every day now. Wow. They got a garden. They do plays. They got a news magazine called The Juke Joint. Uh huh. And so they're still doing, I got them in the creative writing class, different book club at least once a month. And so, I transferred to CMCF where I met Lemuel. Mm -hmm. I was getting ready to leave my office and the phone rang and it was him calling the wrong prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a driver in Mississippi. He's trying to get to Woodville. We're trying to find this prison in Woodville, but I can't get a hold to the warden. I said, well, what do you got? He said, well, I got some bag. I'm crystal behind bars. You can look it up. I pull up the computer. I look it up. I said, OK. I said, Didn't know much about it. I said, well, you can bring him here. <laughs> so he said, let me call my driver, and I'll see. His driver was probably like an hour away. I was getting ready to get off. I said, well, I'll stay, because I know how important practices are in yes. prison for people. Mm -hmm. I said, well, how many do you have? And he said, how many inmates you got there? I said, I got about 3,500. He said, I got about 4,000 bags. Wow. <laughs> look at God. Driver yeah, came yeah. in. I convinced the superintendent to stay, <laughs> took the truck, we backed him up, and I went, every time he sent a, a truck there, I make sure that I pass, I touch the bag and give it to a guy. Yeah. And kind of witness to him. Yes. You know, after, in mm -hmm. the whole zone and everything. So that's how we met. That was the first time. He said, look, I need my bags back. You got to fold them up this kind of way. He gave me a description. Oh, yeah. So I fold <laughs> them up, and I see, I hold them for the next time. Yes. And so I'm like, okay, that was just a one-time thing. I'm thinking... And so he calls me back a few months. He said, you got another prison? I said, yeah, I got um, MDOC at Parchment. He took bags there. We hit a county jail. And then he went to SMCI all the way down. Mm -hmm. So Christmas Behind Bars has been a blessing mm. to the state of Mississippi. That's so now I got wardens calling me from, because news spread about good news in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're calling me from New Orleans and a couple of parishes in Louisiana. So I talked to him about getting some. Yeah. down there and that's what I want to do. Well, well, praise God. Lemuel, what were you going to say? Jason, the way we got connected with Mississippi <clears throat> is my little brother was driving semi down through Alabama. He's supposed to deliver at Graceville Prison tomorrow morning in mm -hmm. Florida. My little brother had a heart attack and he didn't make it to Graceville. And so we canceled Graceville till the next day. Someone got me an airline ticket. I flew down, got my little brother's semi, mm -hmm. went on down and delivered at Graceville. The warden come out, He's, he said, I'm sorry about your brother, I'm sorry, we're praying for your brother. Um, long story short, brother died, but I pray he gave his heart to Jesus. Mm. But the warden from Graceville Prison used to be a warden in Mississippi. And I said, warden, I said, do you know of any other prisons? My brother never would have asked that question. So through my brother's passing, mm. the warden connected us with Mississippi. So thousands of lives have been encouraged mm. through, through that what I thought was tragedy, but I prayed to see him in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So, Amen. Amen. That's how we yeah, that's, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing your story. We, I mean, I wish we had more time to hear <laughs> some more of it. We have some more pictures that we're going to go through. And, and Lemuel, why don't you tell us a little bit about these pictures? Okay, sounds great. Now, this is the Putmanville Correctional Facility where you were incarcerated, Ben, and where Donnie, Donnie had been incarcerated. So here we're in the chow hall, and we have all of our volunteers, all the bags, 2,000 of them are sitting there. And so the inmates will come through there one at a time, get their package, get a handshake, get a word of encouragement, and be invited to come out to the chapel. Mm. Because after they get their package, they have a choice now whether they want to come out to the chapel. And that's where we have an opportunity to do ongoing mm. evangelism in the prison. So that's really cool. So, yes, absolutely. So. Do Donnie, why don't you share a little bit of your story? Well, where to begin? <laughs> as, as a childhood, I never, I really didn't have a normal childhood. Okay. I grew up in an abusive family. My dad was an alcoholic. Wanted to come home, beat on me and my mom. And I wasn't ever scared of the boogeyman or the monster under my bed. Mm -hmm. It was my dad. Mm. Yeah. And, well, it led to the streets. Mm -hmm. After my dad left when I was probably about 13, I joined a gang. And I never realized that fast as of being of a, a career criminal. Mm -hmm. And 
I was a career criminal by the time I was 21. And I did a lot of, I mean, I did a lot of time. Uh, I've had charges from racketeering to corrupt business to welfare fraud. And I never believed that God was gonna change my life. Mm -hmm. But he came in on my last prison sentence. Mm -hmm. And you're taking somebody, I was dyslexic mm -hmm. wow. and I couldn't read. Mm -hmm. And I never really was good in school. So mm -hmm. it was, um, I quit. So I didn't have an education. So the Bible was the very first book I ever read. Mm. And what happened was I, I was facing, well, I ended up getting 58 years. 58 years, yes. Don? And I already, I already had, at this time I had, after the 58, I had 59 felony convictions and had the habitual on me three times. I don't know how I'm out here today. I mean, if it wasn't God's grace and His mercy, Amen. and Amen. I wouldn't be here. But Amen. long story short was, is I came in the prison system, and when they bring you in, they put you in a room. Well, the, I didn't have a bunkie, so I was in a room alone, and there was a Bible on the bed, and mm -hmm. it was just glowing. And mm -hmm. I could never fill that gap mm -hmm. of... Um, with cars, money, yeah. material things, anything like that. And I knew I was missing something in my life. And I was just like, God, you know, I was thinking, well, what is it? And, but when that Bible was glowing in that room, it was the very first book I read, but yes. I fell to my knees and, and I was overwhelmed with his love. Mm -hmm. And I just felt his presence. Mm -hmm. He wrapped his arms around me. Amen. So I knew it was a big change in my life, but really what sold the deal was, I went to a, a chaplain service and the pastor said, Christ come to save sinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, can you repeat that again? Uh -huh. And he, he repeated it three times. Uh, and the second time he said, yeah, he come to save sinners. Third time he repeated, I think he was getting kind of frustrated. And he said, yeah, Christ come to save sinners like you and me. And I said, so you're telling me come on. that I could be forgiven for all this Come bad on. that I did. Yes. And he said, yeah. And I said, you must be a used car salesman because <laughs> you just sold me the deal. <laughs> because from right then, that, that, that day, the closer I draw to him, uh, he draw closer to me. Oh, that's good. And also, that's made it where I wanted more of him. <laughs> yes. But so I went through my <laughs> discarceration. Stuff. I was facing 58 years. Mm -hmm. and. What happened was I started getting an inside outside dad, the plus program. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a change. Got a high school diploma from, I think it was through a Penn Foster. Wow. And well, I got a lawyer mm -hmm. and end up going back to court and end up giving them, well, I, I go to court and I'm thinking, well, this ain't gonna work out. They took a progress report and I'm thinking, well, nothing's gonna happen out of it. Well, God had other plans. Amen. Mm -hmm. And well, that day when I went in front of the prosecutor, he said, I think you did enough time. I'm gonna send you home. Wow. wow. And it was a blessing because I was like, somebody pinched me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. And that day forward, I never turned back. Yeah. Come on. So yeah. now Amen. I'm, I feel like this is the way that I give back, going back into prisons, mm -hmm. letting them know, because God spoke to me that, that day and that he said, I want you to go back and tell everybody what I've done in your life. Yes. And I, I couldn't really think about why are you saying this to me? But once a, we have a buddy named uh, Cody. Okay. And Cody came, what happened was Cody called me and said, you want to go back uh, to Miami County for Christmas behind bars? And mm -hmm. I said, sure, why not? And this is about six years ago, I met Lanyard. Wow. And we went in there and he put me on a spot in front of about 200 <laughs> inmates. Uh, he said, you're going uh, up, you want to go up next? I said, no, nah, no. Nah. Uh, yeah. The room got bigger and the lights got bigger. And I was like, eh. I, I, I figured, you know, it's kind of like social anxiety. Uh -huh. And I, I was scared. I said, well, nope. And uh, I couldn't get out of it because my, my back was against the wall. Yes. And so he called me up there and the room got bigger, the lights got bigger. And I really don't know what I said, but 
just afterwards, mm -hmm. how the inmates just, they was like, man, you did good. Yeah. And, and it was something they needed to hear. The Lord but handing did. them that yeah. package, it prung out everything. And I said, look, this is something I want to do. Right. Now I know what his, what he's calling me to do. Yes. But I also do like, a, you ever heard of Kairos? Yep. Prison no. ministry, uh -huh. I do that too. Okay. So it's being active in all this is what keeps me from going back to the old me. Yes. But I know that I would never go back to that because there ain't nothing there. Mm -hmm. I can't even sin right, you know. Yeah. Before it was easy to sin. <laughs> Today it's no. Yeah. But the calling on my life was like the feet on the cross. Mm. And it was like I was saying, hey, God, you know, Jesus, remember me. Mm. And he, he said, I already prepared a place for you. And today I'm living in paradise because mm. he pulled me from the pits of hell mm. and gave me life. And, you know, it says in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as in heaven. That's mm. why I say we're living in paradise. Mm. Wow. Because why wait till you get there? You got to live it right now. Mm. Man, Donnie, you didn't yeah, look when when we were talking before this. You didn't tell me you were a preacher. <laughs> this is, you, I mean, that is in, it's incredible. It, it ain't me; God it's him. You. Yes, yes. Yeah. I I, I want to find out what was it like for you when you found out when you heard fifty eight years that you were getting sentenced to fifty eight years. What was going through your mind at that time? Well, I had a wife and two kids, oh. and mm. there was a lot of Regrets, mm -hmm. shame. Mm -hmm. uh, I was blaming it on myself, mm -hmm. which it was my fault because God gives us the free will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard thing to, to face, but I knew I had to face it. There wasn't no way out. There wasn't a back door that I could run out yes. or anything like that. I knew I had to man up and just whatever was going to happen was going to happen. Yes. But me surrendering my life to Christ, mm -hmm. it changed everything. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could give anybody any kind of hope, this is what I would say, you know, lean into him and he'll draw near to you. Amen. Because Amen. his right. love, he says, come to me as you are. Mm -hmm. And he, when you come to you as you are, he, go, he sorts through your problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the thing about it is I, I realized that he said, I would never leave you or forsaken you. And he didn't. Mm -hmm. He made a, I mean, he changed my life and for the good. Mm -hmm. And for years I struggled with forgiving myself, mm -hmm. but I had to give a, a talk uh, on forgiveness at this, um, it's called Lamp Lighter. And it's a men's weekend retreat. And they asked me to give a talk and it was on forgiveness. And it stood out the most. I was running around with this book bag full of weight and it was all the weight of the sin that I was holding against myself. I couldn't forgive myself. So I was carrying it around for so long that I had to release it. And then once I released it, it was just like, whew, mm. hey, the shackles was gone. I was ready to run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was set free. Mm -hmm. I was no longer, a, I mean, I really wasn't no, no longer a slave of captivity no more. Yes. I mean, I was set free. Yeah. You know the old saying, who the sun sets free is free indeed. Free indeed. Well, I'm yeah. free. Absolutely. Mm, that's good. Indeed. Lemuel? I'd like to say that the first prison he came back to was about 3,000 inmates. So the Miami Correctional Facility, how did that make you feel when you came in? Because you've received quite a few packages, yes, right, I did. over the years. So for you to come back in, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, You're right. but you've got a story to share and it brings the inmates hope hearing from you mm -hmm. and then hearing from people like you that maybe never, so the Lord has a great uh, package. So how did that make you feel to go back and give back? It, it, it's an honor. It's really an honor because mm -hmm. the blessings that he blessed me with, and I remember that him telling me, you need to go back and tell somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when you see the, the looks on these guys' face, and when you, you get up there and share your testimony, mm -hmm. or if we get to be able to go out there and pray for them and mm -hmm. just bless them mm -hmm. and really get into their lives mm -hmm. where Nobody, a lot of people don't want to go back into prisons. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I was yeah. one of them. I said, I ain't going back in there. I hear that. But I <laughs> ended up going back in there, and it was my calling. Yes. And I guess, really honestly, it was a blessing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought I was going in there giving somebody some hope. 
It was the opposite. <laughs> they was giving me hope. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sheriff Sproles, yes. real quick, what does it make you feel like as you're listening to these stories? Because you, you see a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mm -hmm. see the other side of things, mm -hmm. but sitting here hearing these stories, the transformation that's taken place, how does that make you feel? Well, I, I love it. And, um, you know, one thing that I tell our inmates, and, and I want to tell these guys, um, they, their, their story and their message is so much more powerful than mine. Um, you know, we, the, the people that are in jails, um, they don't really trust the police. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just a, 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 an illustration, when, when I went with Christmas behind bars to the Pendleton Reformatory, mm -hmm. Ali Mule had called and asked if I would come. And I said, man, I'd love to. And he said, hey, would you wear your uniform? And I said, uh, we're going to be inside uh, the prison. And uh, he said, yeah. So I said, man, that's a little bit dangerous. Obviously, I won't, my, won't take my firearm in. So, but, but this is so, this is so important. I learned a great lesson um, and I've been able to share uh, from this. But when I walked in, um, I was a little apprehensive about it. And there's about a hundred and some inmates there helping load these bags. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just shaking hands and, and uh, you know, meeting all these people. And uh, this one big old, this one big old boy, he was looking at me, he said, brother, he said, I got to tell you something, man. Now this is, this, hear this, this is important. Uh, he said, uh, I've been in here 16 years. Mm -hmm. And he said, when I saw you walk through that door in that uniform, he said, man, I looked around, I knew I had to run. And he said, <laughs> and, it, and it's so important. He said, I knew there's nowhere to run, yeah. but he said, it's just, he said, that's just the way it is. Mm. And so, you know, I've gone back and told our officers, mm -hmm. Amen. listen, guys, just because somebody is shaking like this when they're holding their license, don't mean they're hiding dope. Come on. True. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And hey, what are you, what are you shaking like? What are you sweating for? Are you hiding something? Mm. No, they have true trauma mm -hmm. that they have dealt with for years. Mm -hmm. And we have got to understand that. We have got to build a culture of trust. Yes. And, and so I've learned so many things. So Christmas Behind Bars has done so much more than just give inmates hope. They've given me encouragement, making connections with these guys. I'm telling you what, these, these testimonies here were worth, worth my nine hours on the road today. They're worth 24 hours on the road today. I love it. And, uh, you know, God is going to use these people. Yes. He's going to use their testimony. Mm. And uh, I just, I tell you, I'm right where the Lord wants me. Amen. And I love it. And I love ministering to people. I love caring for people. Amen. Amen. Yes. Lemuel? I'd like to say that we heard from the sheriff how that these people are being used. Mm -hmm. We want to talk to the people at home right now, Jason. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because prison ministry <clears throat> is great and beautiful in and of itself. You know, Christ sent the demoniacs back to their own hometown to mm -hmm. share what he'd done. Mm -hmm. And that's what this brother did. He's mm -hmm. going back. Um, but people at home can get involved in jail and prison ministry. Mm -hmm. It's not just Christmas behind bars. That's great. The Lord has built it. But we want people to realize whether they're pastors or whether they're chaplains, that they can do something in their own local county mm -hmm. jail. Because mm -hmm. if somebody mm -hmm. showed up at your jail, um, let's say somebody that saw this program mm -hmm. and they go down to the county jail, mm -hmm. what, what would you tell them when they go down to the jail, what they'd like to be involved with? Okay. Yeah, well, um, you know, there's many ways to be involved. Uh, one thing that I'm, I would say, uh, I, it's, I, I laugh about it, but I go back to when I bought these bags, these little bags, and I had $4,000 in, in, in it just for our jail only, 220 inmates. Um, you know, one thing that, that we can do is give. Mm -hmm. I, I always, I've heard this statement many times, you can never be more like Christ than when you give. Hmm. Yes. For he Amen. gave his Amen. only begotten son. And, and so, um, you know, it does, it, one thing it boils down to is, is, is money. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I remember talking to a friend, a dear friend of mine, um, an old farmer friend who, who told me one day, he said, you know what? I just feel like I'm, I'm just helpless. He said, I don't, I, I'm worthless. I'm 95 years old. I can't do much. Mm. And I thought you're 95 years old, sitting on more millions than I can count. Mm. Um, we have, you know, you can right from your home. First, you can pray. Yes. You can pray, pray for the ministry, pray for those, uh, the, the literature in the bags mm -hmm. to connect. Like you said, the Bible was glowing. Yes. Oh man, that's the Lord. That's the Lord working through prayers. And, mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, 
I, I would say get, let's give because the thousands, I have no idea. Oh, it's Man, lot. it's a lot of money. Lot. But there are people out there who can, uh, who can perpetuate, promote this gospel Amen. by writing a check. Yes. We just bought a whole semi load of hygiene items. It was twelve thousand mm. dollars. I mean, but hygiene items, soap, mm. shampoo, wow. deodorant. I I um, bought a whole semi load of ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. They said ten cents a piece. I said I'll take them, mm. but I didn't realize that one hundred forty-four thousand packs of ramen noodles times ten cents. Wow. I I didn't realize it was that much, but I got the ramen noodles. Yeah. And we're still paying study Bibles, yeah. Andrew's study Bibles. We committed that every woman could get a study Bible. They're a lot of money, and I'm still so, mm -hmm. but God's good, so thank you, Amen. brother. I appreciate right. that yeah. encouragement yeah. to our yes. viewers. Yes. yes. So, Lemuel, with Christmas Behind Bars, give us a little bit of the history behind Christmas Behind Bars, how it got started and how it's grown. I know we have a short amount of time, but. Well, Christmas Behind Bars started with a willingness that I got out of prison 40 years ago and I struggled with addiction. Mm -hmm. I used to take narcotics back and meet the officer down at the McDonald's to take the drugs in there that my friends would send me money in the post office box. Wow. And, and so I bought all this stuff and I was broken. I was empty. I was hopeless. It was negative. It was awful. I was more free in a maximum security prison, Jason, than I was out there in society. On the other side of that barbed wire, I was more free in prison, suffering with drug addiction. I went to treatment. Mm -hmm. And the doctors want to give me more dope. Mm -hmm. They want to give you methadone and an abuse. Mm -hmm. No, dude, I threw my dope in the parking lot tonight. Last night, I threw it in the parking lot and I walked into treatment. I don't want methadone. I don't want an abuse. I wanted change. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a uh, pastor that came to pray with me in that hospital room. I was there maybe a day and a half, two days in treatment. I don't remember. Knock on my door. He'd like to come in. And he told me what Jesus had done for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He got addicted to cough syrup when his mother died. Mm -hmm. And Jesus helped him with that. Mm -hmm. And he left. I pushed the bed back up against the door and I was in the valley decision. Do I want to try or not try? Sure, I want to try. I want change. That's why I came to treatment. And I saw the most beautiful sunset I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Third grade, I heard there were no two snowflakes created the same. Mm -hmm. And I saw that sunset. I said, I bet there's no two sunsets created the mm -hmm. same either. Mm -hmm. I said, if he can paint that, he can help me. And I mm -hmm. kneeled down and I prayed. I said, dear Jesus, please help me. I want to quit, but I can't. We began going to that pastor's church. Mm -hmm. And that December, his wife had the idea of making packages for the folk in the local mm -hmm. county jail. Great so that's job. how it started, Jay. Awesome. Wow. Now, Thanks, now, when yeah. you were making those packages, they started off small. They, they were little lunch size sacks. So they had granola bar, apple yeah. in there, because you don't get <laughs> fresh fruit in jail. They had an orange in there, you know, put a banana in there. And, and so they started off little. Mm -hmm. And we went down to the jail, and they, they passed them through the bars to the inmates. And then the next year, I thought, I'll make them bigger. So instead of a little package, we made them bigger because I was hoping they'd open the door. And boy, stuffed them through the food slot, through the tray mm -hmm. slot. And then I thought, chaplain said, now you got to keep them small enough to fit through there. Then I thought, well, if I make them bigger, mm -hmm. I bet they'll open that door. Mm -hmm. And I didn't <laughs> tell nobody. So we got the big brown grocery sack now. And mm -hmm. so we show up at the jail. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell the church. I didn't tell nobody. Show up at the jail. They had a little committee meeting. The officers all met down at the end of the hallway. Said, I guess we'll have to let them go in. They opened the, they opened the jail. Now we mm -hmm. got to go in and share with them the love of Christ and why we're there for about 10 minutes in each mm -hmm. pod. So that's how, that's how the bags got bigger. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. Those bags are <laughs> oh, huge. Thick. Yeah, his yeah. cost of four four thousand dollars for 200 bags. I can't begin to tell you what these bags cost, mm -hmm. but it's not about the cost. Mm -hmm. It's about Donnie's life mm -hmm. committed to Christ. Right. It's about our chaplain in Mississippi mm -hmm. seeing the joy and the value and hope mm -hmm. in the state of Mississippi. It's about my brother Ben receive a package and know there's hope for his life. Mm -hmm. It's about a sheriff to come and help pack 3,000 packages in a maximum security prison and says there's hope for your life. Mm -hmm. And so, on, Jay, all I can say is God is good. Through your yes. own personal yeah. testimony, Amen. he's brought you out of darkness. Yeah. darkness. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would you say to the individual at home who has a loved one that's incarcerated, what can they do for their loved one? I would say hold on, don't give up. Good. For a mother that's at home still praying for Johnny boy, mm -hmm. no matter. And so maybe you put your son through treatment and spent thousands of dollars to send him mm -hmm. to treatment. He didn't get nothing in treatment if he didn't have Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so family members, hold on, keep praying, mm -hmm. support, write a letter. Don't leave them abandoned at that point in their life when there's opportunity mm -hmm. for change. Yes. You know, that's a, so that's a dark place, but the darker the night, the brighter the light. So, amen. Amen. That's right. amen. Now, maybe there's somebody at home that's like, hey, you know, I, I've, I've really 
been touched by what I've been watching. I want to support the ministry of Christmas Behind Bars. What's your website? Uh, ChristmasBehindBars.org. Okay. ChristmasBehindBars.org. And no matter how dark the night, God created humanity in His image. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. He created light when it was the darkest time in Earth's history. Mm -hmm. And on the cross of Calvary, now He brings that hope through His shed blood, through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what are some needs of your organization? Needs, we need homemade thinking of you cards. We need volunteers to get involved. We'll come to your church. We'll share with you about the program. We'll try to help get you started. On the second hour, we're going to hear from volunteer coordinators who help facilitate this mm -hmm. ongoing ministry yes. in different states. So yeah, yes. it's awesome. All right, let's go. We've got uh, just a few seconds here. Ben, let's start with you. Give me a final thought. Uh, I just would like to share that uh, just because you know somebody who's out there that might have struggled in the past, their mistakes don't define them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always hope. God can, God can and will change. Amen. People. Amen. Sheriff Sproles. Last uh, last message I think to the people. I I just want to share the hope of Christ. Amen. Yeah. And I want to share that we care. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, that, that God cares. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Donnie? I just want to let everybody know you are someone. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he ain't ever gave up on us. Mm -hmm. yes. We wouldn't be here today if, if he gave up on us. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. That's right. So just don't give up. Amen. There is hope. Amen. 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 Chaplain? Uh, I would like to just say, love everybody, man, as Christ loved us. Mm -hmm. Because somebody's down and downtrodden, <coughs> don't think that you're so holy that you can't see mm -hmm. Christ in them. Mm -hmm. You know, so Amen. look at them through the same prism as Christ looked upon us Amen. and accepted us back and Jesus. redeemed us. Amen. Amen. That's very good. Lemuel? I just want to say thanks to all of our sponsors for the Christmas Behind Bars ministry. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. This, is, this first hour has been incredible. Thank you all for coming on and sharing. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a brief break. We will be right back with more to come, playing some musical chairs, and more blessings are on the way. Amen. I'm so glad you stuck with us for the second hour. It's going to be another power-packed hour. You're going to hear all about what God is doing through the wonderful ministry of Christmas Behind Bars. We played a little bit of musical chairs, but we still have Lemuel. And uh, Lemuel, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away and introduce who we have here with us. Jay, the first hour was phenomenal. It shares testimonies of people that's been incarcerated. And the sheriff is somebody that runs a whole county. Mm -hmm. So he's in charge of that dynamic. And so we're grateful to have uh, Mr. Sproles, Sproles. Sproles back. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, he was in our first hour. We have Vicki Funk. And Vicki is our program coordinator for the whole state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And that's phenomenal. She's mm -hmm. helped connect the dots with Chaplain Welch. So Chaplain Welch is actually a chaplain at the Decatur, Illinois prison. So mm -hmm. she's over all of the women in that prison and her care is for Christ, for these Amen. people. Uh, we have Michael, he traveled up here from Kentucky. Now Michael actually has received packages, but he's also been able to go back, give back, hand them out. And when he goes into that door, they say, wow, what are you doing here? Amen. And he can share the power and transformation of Christ. We have Mitchell Barfield, which is near and dear to our heart and the ministry. Mitchell has been an intricate part of Christmas Behind Bars for many years. And uh, it's a great blessing. Mitchell, thank you for traveling up here as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We're looking forward to hearing your story and the impact that you've been able to make uh, by the grace of God. But Lemuel, we have a video that we're getting ready to go to. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what we can expect? In this next video, we're going to see how important these packages are to the family members. We just delivered last week 1,600 packages to the maximum security prison where I was in prison. The next morning, I got a phone call and it was from this lady saying that her husband, 30 years incarcerated, mm -hmm. just went to prison, and she's holding on, and she called to say thank you. That's where we're going. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, Lemuel, let's take a look at that video right now. Hi, my name is Leah, and my husband is incarcerated in the state of Indiana. 
I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to those who volunteer with their time, their money, and their resources to Christmas Behind Bars. It may seem like such a small ministry, but it really means a lot to inmates. It doesn't just mean a lot to inmates, but to their families. It can often feel like that we are forgotten about as a spouse of an inmate or a loved one. It can be very disheartening. To know that there are men and women who take their time to go into the prison and even make my husband a homemade card means so much. You are not forgotten. Please continue to pray for inmates and for their families. And thank you again to our sponsors. God bless you. Hi, my name is Francisco Souza. I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Lafayette, Tennessee. For almost 13 years, we've been together doing big prisons, jail ministries, and help other people with literature and some uh, snacks, good. But the most important thing, Lamil is one of them a few years ago, and he promised God, if you bless me, get out of here, this situation, I will be involved on the ministry of helping others and in everybody in the prison when I we go visit them they ask Francisco when Christmas behind by coming when Christmas behind by coming serve is one of the best things what Christians is supposed to do today special especially living on this time is a such a time is today God bless you and if you have a chance to support this ministry, Christmas Behind Bars, do it, because we do it for Jesus. Thank you, God bless you. My name is Chaplain William Douglas Walker. I'm the chaplain at ATEF, Alabama Therapeutic Education Facility. It's a re-entry facility owned by GO Group. I'm on here to talk about uh, what this ministry means to me. But first, I want to let you know that God has delivered me from alcohol and drugs and all criminal activities for 30 years. And so I said to God, if he pulled me out, I will go back in. So I've been in prison ministry for about 28 years, and I'm just delighted to be able to share back what God gave to me. And so uh, when I met uh, Lemuel Vega, automatically we we kind of had kindred spirits and um when i heard about him uh and, and and some of the ladies and some of the men that my facility have heard about and i finally got in touch with him and i tapped into it and man it was right on time and he delivered not only he delivered once but he delivered twice and they are asking me now when is he coming back so i'm just grateful that God has put on his heart. Thank God for all the labor of love. Thank God for all the contributions, all the people who help, all the people who give. Please keep giving. Because one thing about it, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was cold, you didn't bring me no clothes. When I was thirsty, you didn't bring me no water. So, so it is good to be able to give to somebody who really needed, really wanted, really need that second chance, that 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 hope of love, that 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 love that uh, nobody um, seemed to want to give it to them. So I'm just grateful to be able to be on this video. Hi, my name's Cody, and uh, I just go around with this Christmas behind bars and. I watched miracles happen, and uh, there was a guy that I'm dealing with right now, and you know it. He's in a prison, and he's doing good. He's actually out of the prison now at a work release, but he'd done a lot of time in prison. And when he arrived at the county jail he was in, he was uh, suicidal. He was so depressed, and he lost all hope, and he was tired that uh, one day Christmas Behind Bars showed up at that county jail and he received a package. And when he received that package, he went from wanting to take his life to having life. He went from the darkness to the light. It changed his whole deal. And I just want someone to know out there that uh, there is a hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I wanna read you a scripture that says in uh, Psalms 40, two, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. In Romans 12.12 12, it says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. I would like to pray today and hope that someone that hears this prayer and I'm just doing this for the Lord 
to reach to someone who right now may be suicidal, depressed, so aggravated and frustrated. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to cry out. I'm going to cry out for you. Father God, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. I just ask you for a hope. And I ask you right now, there's somebody right now that is so tired. They can't do it no more. I ask you to give them a hope and a future like you said in Jeremiah 29, 11. You know the plans for their life, Lord. And Father, I just ask that this reaches someone, someone's ears, because I didn't know how to pray before, but you stepped in on me one day in that jail cell and changed the whole deal. And Father, I'm so grateful because today I do have hope. I do have an endurance that I never had before. I do have a strength that I never had before. I do have clarity and I am clean today only because of you, Father God. And Lord, I just come to you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I ask you to hold up whoever's wanting to give up. I ask you for mercy to rain down from the heavens over them. I ask you to carry them through right now. And Father, we just thank you for loving on us and getting us to where we need to get to. And I thank you, Lord, for going forth on this Christmas behind bars, on, on any prison ministries that gives someone a hope. And I watch Christmas behind bars. I've heard story after story of how it's gave people hope in a dark place. Some of them that will never have a visitor. They'll never have no one put any money on their books. They'll never have a phone call. And Christmas behind bars will show up and give them a hope and give them a visit when they feel like everybody has abandoned them. And I thank you, Lord, for this ministry. I thank you, Father God, for going before us. And I thank you for giving them a hope and a future right where they're at. And most of all, Lord, I thank you that you can set the captives free right where they're at. It don't matter whether they're dressed out in street clothes or dressed out in prison clothes. They can have freedom right where they're at. And Lord, I thank you for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Wow. You know what? It's, it's no secret. I mean, we can see the fruits um, of Christmas behind bars, what God is doing through the ministry of Christmas behind bars and how lives are being transformed. You know, Mitch, I want to come to you um, and find out a little bit about your role with Christmas Behind Bars, what's it like being a, what's your role, a coordinator? Well, it, it, you can see how God works. Tom Brito and I were going door to door one afternoon and we knocked on this door and a father come to the door and you could tell there was some tension in the house. Mm -hmm. And so he, he let us come in and he was arguing with his 20 year old son who was drugged out. And so Tom and I sat there and we had prayer with his father and, and Stephen was his name. And we were impressed with him. Uh, you can see there's a burning desire of the young man to get off of it, but he, he didn't have no help. So we went on through the week. Next week, we was going to do door to door again. And Tom said, Mitch, let's go see if Stephen's home. We go there and uh, his father opened the door in tears. He got locked up that week and was locked up in the county jail there in Lafayette. So we went, finished door to door and Tom said, let's go see if we can see him at jail. We have no credentials, no nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, we just go, go up to jail, and there's a phone, you pick it up, we call, and Sergeant Racky, God had our place right there. And we told her who we were. We'd come to see this young man. We'd met him, and he, and he found out he was in jail. And they said, okay, we got a multi-purpose room you can see him in. Mm -hmm. wow. And she, she goes, is there anybody else you want to see? <laughs> and my friend Tom goes, anybody wants to come? <laughs> so we come into the jail, and I, they gave us an hour with him, got to meet Stephen. And, of course, he's innocent. He tells us his story. Uh -huh. And uh, after we get through, we had prayer with him, and we're coming back out. And Sergeant Racky asks us, I've never seen you two before. Hmm. And they said, where are you from? We said, we're from Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lafayette. Could we come next week? They said, yeah. I said, how about the women? Do you have women? They said, yes, the women can come too. So we go home and uh, we, we uh, tell, tell it to our wives. And the next week after church, we, we go. And my wife and Tom's wife went to see the women. We get home and we turn our TV on to 3 a.m. And there says Samuel <laughs> on this program with Christmas Behind Bars. Wow. So we, my wife called up right then. Mm. And uh, Lemuel 
within a couple of uh, days, brought him and his beautiful bride and his, his French poodle, and they spent the night with us, and they come to our church and, and gave a beautiful sermon, and he went to the prison, the, the, uh, it's the county jail with us. Okay. And so by God's grace, uh, we have been going to four county jails there in the area and one county prison uh, that, that Lynn was spoke of today earlier. And the Lord is really blessed. Amen. And uh, Michael is one of the recipients who was at that jail there who met Francisco. Uh, uh, who was there, there worshiping that Sabbath. Wow. Tell us about that, Michael. Uh, well, I, I received uh, packages from him, uh, a couple separate, well, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, rather, you know, uh, and of course, they were really hospitable. They were mm -hmm. super friendly and nice. They sung us songs, read some scripture, like gave us some words of encouragement, you know. Uh, but really, what what made the difference is them following up with Bible studies every yes. week. You know, uh, I was an atheist for 25 years, you know, like, uh, and hadn't really ever looked at a Bible or anything like that. And really, one of the things that caught my eye on the floor was the Great Controversy. Okay. And uh, me at the time, I was like, well, I'm kind of like controversy, you know, <laughs> you know this is the greatest one. Let me, let me see what's up with this. You know? yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, my mom had also given me a Bible, you know, and I'm reading these like side by side. And then I start going to the church, you know, the church, any church service they'd have, you know, yes. and I, I got connected with Francisco there. Uh, and I kind of learned what the seven day Adventist was and how they, they believe a little bit different than some of these denominations mm -hmm. I was studying with, but from what I could see more accurately, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, not trying to knock anybody, but what really made an impression was Francisco coming in one day really, really, really tired and asking, begging our forgiveness like, and mm -hmm. us to excuse him for being tired. He'd been in Brazil for a week with his dying father, mm -hmm. trying to trying to comfort his mother and watching his father pass away. And he was talking to a bunch of inmates that most people, you know, don't have the time of day for. And he's begging our forgiveness in the middle of this, you know, in the middle of this room. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, you're going through all that and you're still here. Yes. And it's really showing love, genuine yeah. love. And the man wiped all the tired off his face and did a study for a good hour and a half with us that day. And, uh, but Christmas Behind Bars, uh, if it wasn't for their literature, I would have never received that that truth, you yes. know. And if it wasn't for the Lighthouse Church and my brothers and sisters there following up, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have never had anybody to really lead me to the Lord to show me a different way. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just surrounded by inmates, mm -hmm. you know, that um, most of them not trying to change. So I, I was very blessed by, by his ministry, his bags a couple different times, Good. you know, uh, and Last year, I got to the, the the biggest blessing of going back and handing these out. And, uh, you know, every pod that I walked into, there's two or three guys that was, hey, what are you doing? And giving me hugs. And, uh -huh. you know, uh, and uh, nothing here to tell you guys, like, how my life has changed so drastically, yes. you know. And, you know, I was, I was a little nervous, you know, but um, you could see the impact. You could, you know, I could see the impact from my brothers and sisters when I was in, you know, but whenever you have somebody that comes out of it and joins them and comes back in, you know, it's just, it's amazing what the Lord can do, Amen. you know. And Amen. How did that impact your faith going back in there and passing out those bags and, and seeing the expressions on, on your, our fellow incarcerated uh, brothers' faces? Uh, <laughs> to be to be honest, I'm I'm amazed all the time at what that the Lord isn't done with me <laughs> and that His love mm. and mercy towards <laughs> I don't know about what y'all have done, mm. but I know about what I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, and a sinner as as low down as I am, you know, uh, and He could still use me, mm. you know, and He never gives up on me. That every every little glimmer of mm -hmm. something like that that I get to see yeah. really really increases my faith. I'm hoping I can be a bigger part of it this year putting together packages as well as handing them out and hopefully have a little bit better words of encouragement. Amen. Yeah. Amen. What would you say like what kind of advice would you give to somebody who maybe they've gone down the wrong path maybe they're still going down the wrong path. Um, what advice would you give to them? To it, 
transition into the right direction. Right, he's, n he's never done with you. So uh, like a brother said in the earlier segment, just turn to him. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to be perfect to turn to him. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't think anybody has ever been perfect <laughs> and turned to him. You know, uh, yes. so you're not too far gone. Just turn mm -hmm. and resist the devil, mm -hmm. and watch what he'll do. Just mm -hmm. keep an eye open. He'll Amen. show himself. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like what you said there because I mean it's like, you know, y you don't see people waiting until they're healthy to go to the hospital. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. no, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. So you turn to him as you are, and Absolutely. he'll transform you from the inside out. That's, Amen. That's awesome, man. Thank you for sharing that. What's it like for your faith when you go into these places and, and you're passing out the bags and you're seeing transformed lives? You, uh, you, you really begin to see that why God is so long-suffering. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it doesn't happen overnight. Right. Lemma can tell you the story here, stories there. Mm -hmm. There'll be more on the other side, mm -hmm. uh, story that we'll get to hear. Mm -hmm. But it, when you go there, you can see some of them, there's nothing in their eyes. Mm -hmm. It's just blank. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, when, you, when you're preaching your heart out and you're talking about God's love, there's a light coming on. Mm -hmm. You can see some mm -hmm. hope coming. Praise their the face, countenance change. And you know that the Holy Spirit is touching their hearts. Yes. yes. And uh, that, that's what draws you back. Amen. One, one of my brothers like playing a game of golf. You get one good shot, mm -hmm. but it's enough to bring you back to play another 18 holes. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And the same thing with jail ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know somewhere in there that God's going to touch someone. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just that one that really wants to bring you back when you get to see that. Yeah. And Especially you see that countless change. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you know that the Holy Spirit is working. Amen. Yes. Amen. Well, I mean, what's on your mind? You know, he was talking about the bag. And I want our viewers to know the Christmas Behind Bars gift packages was his design. It's not about the bag. Mm -hmm. But we physically get together in the prison. We put together many, many packages, and then we go and distribute them. God transforms the physical efforts, the physical mm -hmm. contents, and do a spiritual application and blessing. Mm -hmm. Time and time again, I felt the Lord. I opened mm -hmm. the bag. It was like the Lord was right beside me and mm -hmm. just really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And as you shared, we don't get all cleaned up first. Mm -hmm. right. Clay stabbed somebody in prison mm -hmm. seven times. Mm -hmm. And in segregation, he said, Lord, if you can just change my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of the gospel. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 You know, Chaplain Welch, we're getting ready to come to you in just a moment, but we have a video that we're going to go to sure. before we dive into your story. Sure. Let's check out that video now. Christmas Behind Bars is a ministry whereby volunteers, in this case hundreds of volunteers, have come together to put together care packages for those that are incarcerated in various places around the country. Uh, these care packages are filled with, well, because it's for the holidays, this is comfort food, not necessarily fruits and veggies, but uh, things that will put a smile on prisoners' faces when they open these bags. Uh, in addition to the comfort food that's there, we've also placed some important literature, literature that talks about Jesus, how to have a relationship with Him, how to be ready for His soon return, and maybe most importantly, it talks about the love of Jesus no matter what the circumstances are. That can be a really important message for those that are in prison, particularly at the holiday season. I've had the opportunity to actually deliver some of these bags at a maximum state prison and also to a women's correctional center. The gratitude that those people express makes it worthwhile. When I went to the maximum state prison, I had to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't a happy camper to think I had to be up at 3 in the morning. But I would do that again and again and again because I see the difference that it makes. You know, having some comfort food, the spiritual literature that's in there. Some of the people that I saw, they have been getting these bags for 12 years. So that's kind of sad because that means they've been in prison for 12 years. But I could see a difference in the cells of the people who actually engage with the literature and let it change their lives. Their cells looked different. They were brighter, they were cleaner, and even the prisoners themselves looked better. So I'm just really grateful for the people that showed up and we're, we're cleaning up now. 
but the mission that we had will continue because these seeds that have been planted are going to make a difference for God's kingdom. And I hope that someday we'll get to hear stories of those whose lives were transformed because of the work that we did today. Thank you so much. Wow. Amen. Amen. You know, I heard something there that Esther said. She said she saw a difference in the lives and, and, and in the cells of people who engaged with the literature. You know, how many of us Christians have seven different Bibles or five different Bibles and then don't engage with the literature? We see a difference there as well. So that's, I mean, that's powerful to see that people are engaging yes. with, with the spiritual material because you put a lot of great snacks yeah. and all that stuff <laughs> in the bag, but that's not the long lasting Amen. material. It's the spiritual <clears throat> material that goes a long way. Lemuel, that was a short video. I know there's something you want to add to that. I believe the packages are just a conduit to put the glow tracks in, to put the spiritual literature in there. Um, Christmas Behind Bars is not a seasonal ministry. Mm -hmm. So it's year round. So we just, on Sunday, we made 6,300 packages at the Andrews University, 6,300 loaded in a semi-trailer, and they'll be going to the state of Nebraska on the 18th of November. So wow. it's a year round ministry. So it's really phenomenal. So it's awesome. So Absolutely. Thank you all for being yeah. part of it. Amen. Amen. Chaplain Welch, tell us a little bit about your involvement with Christmas Behind Bars. I know we had the opportunity and privilege of going into your facility and ministering to the women in there. But uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, what I do is um, I kind of seek um, to help individuals to you know, to know more about Christ mm -hmm. um, and to to show appreciation for things that they receive, yes. you know, kind of the, the, the ministry of appreciation. Mm -hmm. But when I heard of, it was actually an individual who told me that they got this cool bag and, and the people call Christmas behind bars. Mm -hmm. It was around Christmas time, I believe. Oh. And they were so excited about it. And I'm like, okay, tell me more about it. And they said, yes, these people come with Christmas time and whenever they come and they give us these cool bags and you know, things that they don't really have, some yes. of them don't have, and they're so appreciative of it. So I, I think I reached out or I got a call from um, from Vicky mm -hmm. sharing that the Christmas behind bars will be coming in and I'm like tell me more about that and she she told me and I'm like oh wow and then she said oh we're Adventist I'm like Adventist I'm like oh, okay Adventist <laughs> and so um, she told me that you know we want to bring these things in we want to mm -hmm share with the ladies here. And I said, okay, and she gave me Mr. Vega's, Lamuel's number, and I mm -hmm. began talking with him, and we made plans, and um, she shared with me, um, you know, what the donation would look like. Yes. Yeah. And so we had to go through all this protocol and mm -hmm. with the wardens and, you know, and so as we got these things going, you know, we began to build a relationship, of, of, uh, you know, and one of the individual, individuals made a comment that it would be so wonderful if he could come in and do a program. I'm like, uh -huh. like flesh and blood did not reveal that to me. <laughs> <laughs> because I was thinking along the same lines, you yes. know, trying to get volunteers, more volunteers to come in and to spread their wow. ministry. And I'm like, Christmas Behind Bars seems like, you know, a good ministry that would come in and, and mm -hmm. give them hope, you know, mm -hmm. spread some, apart from the packages, you know, I know they love the packages, but some hope, yes. you know, some hope, some encouragement, some of them are sat around Christmas time, Easter mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. you know, so this would be a great priv privilege to, to just have mm -hmm. them come in and share with them. And, you know, speaking with my warden, she was so gracious and, you know, she said, yeah, let, let's see what we can do. And mm -hmm. yes, and it came to pass. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed too that I was thinking Christmas behind bars was just Christmas time. Yes. But to find out it was Easter and mm -hmm. whenever time there it was, so I'm like, okay, we can plan a time. And <laughs> mm -hmm. we did plan a time. And to know that 3ABN would also join in, in the ministry, I was so elated yes. and so excited. And I'm like, okay, let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. And it was a blessing. Yes. It was a blessing. The most um, wonderful thing is 
to receive those Bibles mm -hmm. and to note, even I saw one of my correctional officers, they were saying, wow, wait a minute. Do each, because they have to search the, the uh -huh. items. They were like, wait a minute. Each of these Bible have a message, a personal message in here? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, they do. Yes. You know, and so we're so grateful. Many of the individuals would tell me that they were so um, encouraged by some of the words mm -hmm. that they read from others mm -hmm. who are, you know, interested in their lives, in their, in their, in their, their well-being, so yes. to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we were so grateful to have that you know, have you guys come in. And so I want to, in the spirit or in the Ministry of Appreciation, I just want to share this with you. Oh. It's a <laughs> certificate of appreciation for Christmas Behind Bars. Oh, so this great. is for Mr. Vega. And Vicky, you're a part of it, so we thank you so much. And this is for Tree ABN to take in the time out to come with us, to come to see with, um, be with us and to share your ministry thank with us. Thank you, thank you so much. This thank is so you. nice. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, awarded to 3ABN ministry team for your faithful services to the body of Christ. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise Amen. Praise Amen. Educator Correctional Facility. Yes. Now their packages was a little bit different because for when we just came with 3ABN, we got the hygiene packages approved. So women, something different. They had soap, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, so we prepared and got approved a hygiene package. Mm -hmm. So once that was approved, I said, well, what about a bag of pretzels? <laughs> so we can't put pretzels in hygiene, so we had the hygiene uh, packages prepared, and then we added pretzels, candy, I think some cookies, I'm not sure. Yes. Wow. And then we also got uh, the fresh flowers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fresh flowers. Yes, so. so then we were thinking nice. about uh, utilizing the brand new 3ABN Bible study sets. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, hygiene items, snack items, <laughs> a, a fresh carnation. One lady said she hadn't had a flower for 20 oh, some years. Wow. The last time she had a fresh flower, wow. no flower. Mm -hmm. Then I was driving down the highway and the Lord impressed me about a study Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I called Andrews University mm -hmm. astronaut. I said, hey, what kind of deal can you make us on study Bible? Well, they're real expensive. And I said, can you give us a deal? We're already giving you a deal. And I said, well, we'll take them. So <laughs> put it on the charge card, a bunch of money. Uh, they donated some finances we still owe for the study Bibles. Mm. But then I said, can you write in the Bible? a personal note to the people. Yes. So Esther, they said, well, we got to open up all the Bibles in. I said, yeah, that's what we want. <laughs> so, so the students, they got together one Sabbath wow. afternoon and, and they wrote Bible verses and they wrote a, and then they put them back in the boxes. And all I can say is God was good. Mm. It started with the high dust shampoo wow. to take care of your external, yes. but then the internal come through. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. What was the morale like in there after Christmas Behind Bars was gone? There was. Come there on, were, girl. There were <laughs> 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 Come on, don't stall. <laughs> it's hard to, to express um, what these ladies were feeling. Mm. They were so appreciative that they would stop by my office just to say thanks and mm. to tell um, Mr. Vega how much they appreciate it. Mm. Mm. Some of them mm. were in tears. Yes. Mm. Um, some of them were, I know uh, one of them said to you that you can come back anytime, whether without the package or not, mm -hmm. you can always mm -hmm. come back. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of appreciation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about the packages. Mm -hmm. It was just about that somebody mm -hmm. took the time yes. to put those notes in the Bibles, to, to pack these bags and to bring them, you know, all this way and your truck got some <laughs> troubles coming in <laughs> and all of that. And just to hear the, the testimony of the challenges, you know, to bring those bags and they were there, you know, yes. and they received it. And it wasn't just, just that they wanted to, 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 um, to bring the bags to get uh, what you call it. Um, props or props or whatever. Mm. It was from the heart, you know, yes. and they yep. took that to heart mm -hmm. that people cared about them because many of them don't have, you know, people, people to care. care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I've had two of the staff sergeants personally tell me two to three days after they had received them back, the morale in that jail was totally different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. Totally different. Yeah. 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 It makes a huge difference. It does. Yeah, it does. It makes it does. a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What made you decide to serve in that capacity? Well, 
Well, I've, I was a chaplain for uh, um, hospice okay. prior to going to Decatur and also in counseling. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a, a heart for ministering to women. Mm -hmm. And out of curiosity, I said, you know, I'm going to apply for this job. I'm like, I don't even know if they're going to, you know, mm -hmm. hire me or even recognize. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I applied for the job. I started a new job. And then six months later, I got a call with an offer wow. to, to, to go to, the, to work in the prison. And I'm like, what? I can't leave my care my care my caregivers now because I had case workers. I'm like I can't leave them right now. It's just six months, so you know. But God impressed on my heart. The lady who called with the job offer, she said, "I'll give you another week." Mm -hmm. Another week came. I was still like I don't know, you know. But when I actually took the job, yes. you know. I'm like, oh my goodness, wait a minute. This is all women. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what I've been asking God for, wow. to minister to women. Yes. And, you know, um, when I first went in and they were all in the, in the gymnasium, all these women in the gymnasium, and when they said, we have a new chaplain, and the, mm. the, the breakout in roar that they gave was, I, I just teared up yes. <laughs> and I'm yes. like God this is really this is really where you want me to be mm -hmm. right yeah. now Amen. and I don't know where he's taking me next mm -hmm. but this is where he has me he right now he opened the door yes. for you to walk in yes. and call him. Yes. Lemuel, you want I to love the connection she was a chaplain for hospice yes the dead mm -hmm. the sick the dying mm -hmm. the perishing mm -hmm. and the Lord put her in the chaplaincy mm -hmm. To bring life and hope. So yeah, praise Amen. the Lord. That's awesome. Amen. Yes, and thank you for your service, mm -hmm. Vicky. Hey. Now, I've, I've known you for a little while too. Yep. Yep. Yes. Tell us about what you do um, and how you. Well, got I started prison ministries in 2018, and uh, actually ended up by accident. I was. Uh, my, our church is down the road from Stateville, okay. and I was driving down the road, and the Holy Spirit impressed me to go and, you know, go to do something in prison ministries. And so I contacted the chaplain there, and he said, well, come on in and tell me what you want to do. And I said, all I do is want to send cards. I just want to send birthday cards. <laughs> and he said, no, you're going to come in. You're going to do Bible studies. You're going to do <laughs> Daniel and Revelation. Mm -hmm. He said, I know the Adventists. They're good at that. And you're going to come in. And so I started going in every week mm -hmm. and doing a Bible study on Daniel and Revelation mm -hmm. with 30 guys. Wow. And uh, did that for two or three years couple of years and then COVID hit and mm. then and then I went back in for a little while. But in the meantime, um, I got my church involved in sending cards mm -hmm. and uh, we would send out not only birthday cards, but Christmas cards. I got to know Lemio and I got in touch with him and every year from 2018, uh, we've gone in and delivered bags to mm. the guys at Stateville, wow. uh, both on the maximum side and the NRC side. And then uh, one of the chaplains over at the hospital, because mm -hmm. they built the hospital there. What's, what's the NRC side? What That's the that? uh, receiving side. Okay. So anybody who uh, has gotten sentenced, mm -hmm. uh, they take them to NRC and they stay there until they decide what prison they're going to go to. And then any guys that are in prison um, coming up for court cases, and they'll stay there um, and then they'll take them to court, you mm -hmm. know, for their uh, court cases and so forth. So it's kind of a holding area. But some of the guys can end up there for six months or even longer. Mm -hmm. And um, so you got this constant influx of guys through NRC. So you never know, you know, one year you may deliver the bags there and the next year they're all different, mm -hmm. you know, so you're getting, uh, you're touching a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this past summer we went, uh, got my church together and we put together packets of literature with the thinking of you card and we mailed them out. And I said, mail them out to people that aren't on the list. You know, I have a list of about 500 guys. Mm -hmm. 
wow. to 800 guys wow. that I send Christmas card or birthday cards to. I said, let's send to somebody we haven't sent to before. Mm -hmm. And in there was a letter that said, if you want any books or Bibles or Bible studies, let us know and we'll send them to you for free. Mm -hmm. And we got letters back um, asking for, one guy said, send me books on everything you got, you know. <laughs> And so I'm putting up boxes of books and I'm shipping them to all the prisons in Illinois mm. and Bible studies mm. and Bibles mm. and whatever they ask. And, um, and then I, you know, I send out birthday cards and I get these letters back that mm. says, nobody's ever sent me a letter in the 20 mm. years I've been mm. here. Wow. I've never wow. gotten a birthday card. Wow. I've never, never gotten anything from anyone. Mm. And it's so sad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I just, you know, as one guy gets paroled or drops off the list, I keep adding to the list. So I keep sending out to uh, new guys, you know, because you never know whose mm -hmm. lives you're going to touch. Mm -hmm. And this is so interesting because uh, Lemio, he would take, you know, he'd take the bags into Stateville and there was literature in there. And I remember one guy said that um, somebody had left the, the literature and he picked it up. And he goes, man. And he started reading and studying. He goes, Seventh-day Adventist. He was a Baptist. And he goes, Seventh-day Adventist. He said, they got it together. This is true. And he started writing letters. And he wanted to be baptized as Seventh-day Adventist. And of course, it was during COVID, and we couldn't get in. And he ended up getting transferred. But I still keep in contact with him. And he goes, he said, this is great. And he said, send me literature and I'll send him like three or four books of the same kind and mm -hmm. he'll set them out. And he said, Vicki, they're gone just like mm. that. Wow. He said, guys are looking. Mm. And then he said, I had one guy write me a letter and he said, can you send me a Sabbath school lesson? He had mm. saw 3BN, 3BN's uh, Sabbath school panel mm -hmm. and he said, of course, they're not able to download. Yes. You know, and he said, can you send me a quarterly? I said, absolutely. And uh, I send out about five to six Sabbath school quarterlies every quarter. Wow. And he's one of them. And uh, every, I've been doing that for, I don't know, maybe two or three years. I've been sending out the Sabbath school quarterlies for people that are seeing it on 3ABN, yes. but aren't able to download mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so that they can study along. And it is just, it's been wonderful. Um, just the letters I get, um, guys thanking me, mm -hmm. appreciative, um, the bags. Mm -hmm. um, we try to do um, different uh, prisons. Mm -hmm. um, we've done maybe 13 prisons a few in Illinois. In Illinois. Wow. And Stateville is uh, closed down. So now um, I get some of the guys who have transferred to other prisons are are writing mm -hmm. letters saying, hey, can you come, yes. you know? <laughs> and so we're gonna try to set that up. So th this is all, cause you just named a whole lot, right? Yeah. This is all on top of your nine to five. Yes, job. yes, right. I have a nine to five so job. Yeah. Even on top of all of that. Wow. Right, right. You're doing all the stuff yeah. that you mentioned. I, I right. actually, yeah. when I was going in and teaching, um, uh, I would go in Sundays and mm -hmm. work so that I could take time off to go into the prison because of my job, the demands of my job. Wow. And uh, so I've been kind of like working every Sunday since 2018. So mm -hmm. I'm working, you know, five and a half days. I'm going in mm -hmm. uh, just so I can have time to, yeah. to do prison ministries. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's kind of like I plan my week. Okay, this week I sit down and do the birthday cards and then yes. I'm getting all the packages together to mail out. And then I'm going to the post office yeah. to mail these out. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and then, that's you know, a, so a it's lot. a lot. Yeah, praise know? God for your heart for service and what God is doing yeah. through you. Lemuel, I know you got something. Yeah, real quick, um, the packages uh, at one facility, mm -hmm. the warden said no. So we'd been going in, the warden said no, and Vicki contacted the warden, he said no. And so Vicki went to the congressman here in Illinois, and next thing, somehow a congressman contacted the prison, the prison calls back to Vicki and said, oh no, we want your program. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, God, I mean, God is good. And I, I'll tell you, my first prison 
uh, stint, my first prison visit, mm -hmm. I was probably six years old. My, my brother, my little sister, and my mother and my aunts, and we went to the Joliet Correctional Facility in Statesville, Illinois. As little kids, we went in there for evangelism. And I remember walking in the gymnasium, it didn't smell so good. There was just mm -hmm. a smell about prison. Mm -hmm. And we went up on stage and we sang, I'll make you fishers of men. Mm -hmm. Six, seven years old, mm -hmm. little did I know within 10 years, I'd be looking at 10 to 20 years in prison. Mm -hmm. So God has brought it full circle mm -hmm. now to be able to come back. And mm -hmm. you know, we got people in high places like sheriff and commissioners. Mm -hmm. And so God is in control of kings and judges. And mm -hmm. it's a blessing to have our sheriff yeah. here Amen. in the Amen. second Amen. hour. Sheriff Sproles, yes. uh, tell us a little bit about what happens with the families because multiple people end up doing time. So talk to us about the families. Yeah. You know, when I first took office January of 2023, um, I noticed that our new, our new jail, which had just been finished, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, $25 million place, the way it was designed, all of the uh, correction officers from the jail, they kind of had a, a back exit and entrance where you don't come through the front where the foyer is where all of the family members come in. Uh -huh. And um, I immediately said, this is going to change. Mm -hmm. You're not going out a back entrance. Mm -hmm. You're going to walk through the foyer so you can see mom and dad and kids who are there waiting to get on FaceTime basically mm -hmm. with, with their family back in there. You're going to go back and forth to where it keeps the reality in front mm -hmm. of you of, hey, this is somebody's son, daughter, yes. husband and wife. And um, I'll never forget, um, I was, I had been, it had been a long day and I was walking through the foyer leaving and uh, a, a grandmother was there with maybe a little, she was probably six years old or so. And they're there waiting to go pick up a phone and, and, and view their, you know, talk to their loved one. Mm -hmm. And this little girl jumped off of grandma's lap, come run up to me and grabbed a hold of me. She said, hey, I want to see my, my real mommy, not on the screen mommy. Mm. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, I was so ready to get home. And she said, can you, she said, is my, my real mommy's back in there, right? And I said, I said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, I want you to go get her. Can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, you know what? Just hang on, hang on. I said, who, who is your mommy? And she told me, so I went back there and, um, got her out of her cell and brought her up to a, like where the attorneys can come in and meet wow. them. So, so of course they don't know. So I, I walked back through, I said, Hey, you all come in here. So I opened the door and there's real mommy sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's so important that we, we just remember these are, these are family. These are people that God loves. Uh, and, um, you know, our, our architect came back for a follow up and, uh, he asked me, he said, you know, is there anything about the jail that we need to change? And I said, absolutely. I said, there's just one thing. It's a great place. But I said, just one thing. I said, don't ever design it to where the corrections officers get to slip out the back door, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. He said, I've never heard that before. He said, we always design it that way. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't ever do it again. I said, corrections officers need to know mm -hmm. these people are yes. moms, dads, granddaughters, grandmothers, yes, uh -huh. granddads. Yes. And, um, it just keeps the reality there um, and it, it helps our corrections officers to mm -hmm. treat them as, as family. That's, that's incredible. Yes. I have never heard that mm -hmm. before. That's, mm -hmm. that's powerful. Now, on the other side of things, what have you seen, you know, have you seen children of those that are incarcerated coming in? Interesting, interesting question. So um, as I, I, I had said earlier, I, I was sworn in as a reserve mm -hmm. deputy sheriff for my county on my 21st birthday. I did it for a couple years and got out of it for many, many years because I'm a church builder and I was busy building churches and also starting a, a Christian school. Um, and so I got back into it eight years ago as a reserve and I ran into one of my uh, uh, friends who was on the department back 20 some years ago, who is now the chief of police in, in Newcastle. And I said, uh, I said, hey Matt, I said, what's different now? He said, oh Johnny, he said, not a, uh, not a lot different. He said, you remember all of the regulars that we used to deal with? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. He said, we're just dealing with their kids now. Mm -hmm. wow. And that was so profound and he, yeah. didn't, he didn't mean it that way. He was just being real. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, we're just dealing with all their kids now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, somebody has to break the cycle. And, and I'll tell you, I feel a burden from the Lord uh, for me 
uh, to break that cycle of um, we, we have got to bring Christ back front and center Amen. to law enforcement. Amen. We've got to rebuild the trust that, that we all know is, is broken. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you know what? We're, we're going to be able to do that by God's help and just one person at a time, yeah. mm -hmm. caring for one person at a time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say is one of the greatest challenges in your role? Mm. I, I, think, I think building that level of trust back. Yeah. I think that is the, it's the biggest challenge. Um, as I said earlier, um, these other guys, their testimonies are mm -hmm. so powerful. Yes. Because their buddies trust them. When you mm -hmm. come back and you show that mm -hmm. I'm different, Mm -hmm. They trust, they, and so it, it, it's powerful. Uh, there is, we've just got a long way to go to rebuild the trust between the community and, and, and law enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in my very first debate, uh, when I was campaigning for sheriff, I said, if I'm elected as your next sheriff, the F word mm -hmm. on duty is gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not professional. We don't talk to anybody like that, let alone the citizens. Yep. And, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a, we're, we're working on creating a different culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, the atmosphere in our jail is different. Amen. Yeah, man. And, and I'll tell you, we've had to, uh, we've had to send some people on down the road because they would mm -hmm. berate the inmates, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. F-bombing the inmates. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I told one guy, I said, I'm telling you, don't do it again because yep. I'm not going to tolerate that. And sure enough, he did it again. I pulled him in the office and, and I said, um, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to let you tell me whatever you feel like you need to tell me. Um, and I said, but we're not going to have a back and forth. I said, what I'm going to tell you is you're terminated effective immediately. Mm. Mm. He said, I've been here 15 years. And I said, well, you're not going to be here 15 more minutes mm. because the chief deputy is escorting you to your car and we'll get whatever you need out of the office. Mm -hmm. We do not treat our inmates that way. God loves us. Yeah. Just the same as he loves them. Yes. And we can reverse that. He loves them just the same as he loves us, even yes. though I'm wearing the gold badge. Mm -hmm. um, and and we've, got to, we've got to keep that in focus. We are here to serve people Amen. and, and uh, show it, to show Christ. That's what I'm here Amen. for. Yeah. Amen. 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 That's, that's huge. Well said. Yes. Well Thank said. You. Lemuel, did you ever think, I, I mean, sitting here all these years later, did you ever think that Christmas behind bars would grow to what it is today? We never thought. We just kept going. Mm -hmm. uh, people ask how many prisons, how many states, how many inmates. It's not about how many, it's about that one. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and we've never had a sheriff like this mm -hmm. before. We have a new mm -hmm. warden at the reformatory where I was in mm -hmm. prison at. Mm -hmm. Whole different paradigm. Mm -hmm. They're the same. Mm -hmm. They're on the same page. Mm -hmm. So now the staff treats the volunteers uh, better. The staff treats the, the inmates' families better. So, mm -hmm. so we see a change. And if the change is at the top in that formation, mm -hmm. yep. it's mm -hmm. going to continue to make a difference <laughs> within. I have a story if I, about that child. Can yeah, I share please. that? Okay. Um, so speaking about children, mm -hmm. a little girl mm -hmm. asked you for a favor. Mm -hmm. You know, we were putting together 3,000 packages for this huge prison, one prison. And some, one of the volunteers said that that little boy, his dad is in that prison. And I'm real busy with all the busyness of getting everything together. And when things were starting to get cleaned up, I went over to see that little boy and I kneeled down where I level now, blonde hair, blue eyes. I said, your daddy's in this prison? He said, yes. I said, your daddy's gonna get one of these packages. Mm. I said, if I could find your daddy, I said, would you like me to tell him anything? And this little boy said, yes, tell my daddy that I love him. My daddy killed my mommy. <laughs> that is the love of this wow. little child. I had the privilege of finding that man's cell and I got down at the cuff port and I gave him a personal message from his son. Wow. And I said, your, your son still loves you mm. no matter that you killed his mommy. Wow. Mm. And as we equate that with salvation and eternal life, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, father, if it be possible, mm -hmm. let this cup pass from me. It was a dark time, mm -hmm. but he brings light and hope in the midst of darkness. Yes. And our heavenly father still loves humanity, yes. loves us yes. and extends that privilege of hope mm -hmm. no matter that we killed his only begotten son, Jesus. Yep. 
Amen. That's yeah. powerful. You know, Lemuel, when we go into some of these prisons and jails, I mean, we've, we've gone into quite a few of them. You've gone into more than I have. Mm -hmm. but, um, but when we go in there, you share a, a message and you, you always encourage them to try how many more times? One more time. Yeah. <laughs> One more time. Good. If you appreciate anything about this program, would you do us a favor? Would you, and they'll raise their hand. Mm -hmm. I said, we'd just like to encourage you to try one more time. Good. It's not about an altar yeah. call. It's not, boy, you need to make a commitment to Christ mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. But would you be willing to try one mm -hmm. more time? Mm -hmm. For somebody like Michael, he mm -hmm. might write home and say, honey, I'm sorry. He might call his mom and say, I've changed my life. Or, so just to try mm -hmm. one more mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who's interested in getting involved in prison ministry. Maybe they have a connection at their local jail yeah. and they want to go in there. What would you recommend that they do if they have a program or something that they want to put on? What do you recommend they share? Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Keep oh, it good. simple. Share what Christ has done in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. yep. Share with God. I mean, we've had people get up and say, hey, he helped me with alcoholism. He helped me with anger. He helped me. They need to hear from real people mm -hmm of That's what right. Christ has done for them. You don't have to have a badge. You don't got to have a pastoral degree. Mm -hmm. Share with them what Christ yeah. promised them. And it's, that's, that's the message of Christ. I love, there's something, there's something that you've done in the past that I, that I love. And uh, you'll take like a, a $20 uh, bill. Yes. Or $10 bill, which you're not even supposed to have in jail anyway. But hey, <laughs> but you take a, but you take a $20 bill in, right? Uh, yeah. Right. And, um, and then you, you, Say, how many of you want this $20 mm -hmm. bill? Mm -hmm. uh, and then everybody's hands go up. In fact, why don't you take over and do the illustration? You do it so well. So if you offer an inmate a $20 bill, uh -huh. green money is worth more mm -hmm. in prison than it is on the street. So you take that $20 bill, and you said, how many of you like this if I could give it to you? Some of them raise their hand. They think it's a joke. I said, no, really, how many if I? Majority, almost all of them raise their hand. And if you crumple up that $20 bill and you say, how many of you still want this? Every hand goes up. Mm -hmm. And then you throw it on the ground, you step on it, kick it to the curb. Mm -hmm. I said, how many of you would still want that $20 bill? Mm -hmm. Hands goes up. I said, why? Why would they still mm -hmm. want this, brother? It still why? got intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Huh? It still has intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. Still has, The value's not Same. changed. Yes. And Christ will take you, no matter how Amen. rumpled and mm -hmm. crumpled mm -hmm. you may think you is. Matter of fact, your value is worth more because God gave yes. his only begotten son to buy us back. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of the gospel. So simple analogies Amen. for Christ. Amen. That's, that's powerful. It's like powerful. Christ's object lesson. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yep. Yes. What are the needs of Christmas behind bars? I want to hit that again. I know we talked about it in the first hour, but this is a powerful ministry. I want to approach it again. So share what, what are the needs of your organization? Sure, if I'm going to let you share that because you know different aspects of it, and so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He left a lay of it. <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 and we did not talk about this. I just, I want a, a disclaimer here. We never said anything about this, but I come from a business background. Yes. I'm the founder of Heartland Christian School in Newcastle, oh, wow. uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. Out of the blue, we started 13 years ago. And uh, we've gone from 26 students, grown every year to 230 wow. with a waiting list. And, and I'll tell you what I have found out, um, that it takes, it takes money. Mm -hmm. it, it really takes money. You know, God will supply the need, uh, but, but it, he'll, he'll usually have somebody else still sign their name on the check. Yes. And um, so I can imagine, I can imagine the, the financial uh, burden and... Um, but God, God supplies and God will supply, but God will supply through people like you Amen. and me. Amen. And, um, you know, God has put his, the burden on, on his heart to, to be out uh, hustling and putting this stuff together, pulling these things together. There are people that can, that can sit at home and pray mm -hmm. and write a check. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, it can change the ripple effect Mm -hmm. to that check that you wrote that actually provided a bag or two bags or a thousand bags. Yes. There's some thousand bag people out there and there's, mm -hmm. there's some 10,000 bag people out there. Absolutely. Uh, but the ripple effect that will touch generations to come, change lives mm -hmm. through the message that they, when they were, oh, I love this candy bar and what's this? God loves me? Mm. Really? Yes. Oh, yeah. Man. So you know what? Um, we need people to give Absolutely. and to pray. 
Yeah. I'd like to say on the way to your prison, Chaplain, mm -hmm. I lost a wheel. Yes. Wheel bearing, gone, trailer were running on one wheel. Mm -hmm. I prayed for the last hundred miles. I said, Lord, if I lose another wheel, what do I do? Rent a U-Haul? We ain't going to make it. Yeah. But the Lord brought it all the way. Trailer's still in the shop. It got a new axle ordered. Mm -hmm. But it's all, God is good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All the time. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. So I want your website one more time before we go. Christmasbehindbars.org. Easy peasy. Mm -hmm. Christmasbehindbars.org. <laughs> Christmas yeah. That way people can find out where to mail the check, the check. how they can support right. online yeah. and everything. Thank you all for coming on and sharing. Thank you for your heart for service. We want to thank you for joining us. Make sure you support the wonderful ministry of Christmas Behind Bars and get involved in prison ministry. Until next time, God bless you. Mm -hmm.